e ngā mana, e ngā reo, e ngā maunga, e ngā awa-awa, e ngā pātaka o ngā taonga tuku iho. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Ko Mary Berryman a hau, he uri a hau nō tūhoi. Today I'm going to share in my presentation a focus on Māori as Māori, talking about the learnings from my mokopuna. I'm going to pose some questions to consider about both knowledge and pedagogy. I'm going to talk about whānau type relationships, which I'm suggesting as a platform for one's learning trajectory and identity as a learner. I'm going to talk about ako. That often happens when things go right. I'm going to talk about relational and culturally responsive approaches to pedagogy in terms of literacy. And I'm also going to spend some time talking about what happens when the magic in terms of literacy doesn't happen. I intend to make some links to the research and I'm going to consider implications as a framework for learning and literacy in your own settings. And then I will bring it all together at the end with some conclusionary statements. So the first place I want to go to is this notion of education as being the opening of identities. When we think about it as such, there are two quite diverse points that we often think about in terms of literacy or in terms of learning. Um, a group of people might consider that within children and their families, there is somehow some deficit that resides within that location, which means that we have to come in with remedial programs that sees the child and their family needing to be fixed up in some way. There's another group of thinking, theorising, that looks at the importance of relationships and interactions between students and teachers. And I guess today what I want to pose for you to think about is what are the implications for both of those positions in terms of literacy learning. Uh, as an example, I want to share with you an example from my mokopuna, and I will spend most of my presentation talking about the learnings, the understandings that I have had from my own grandchildren. The, the idea is that when we send children off to school, that we're sending them into a place where they are going to be able to learn and they're going to be able to come, become more competent in the practices of their school community. I guess the challenge for me has been that often the learning that resides in the home doesn't quite often match the learning that is coming out of the school or is being espoused by the school. On the slide you will see two photographs of two of my grandchildren. And I want to tell you a story about each one. The first picture is of my granddaughter, Kira. Um, Kira is now five and she's started school. But at about the time the picture was being taken, she was just learning to form language and she was just learning to talk. It was common practice in her home for her father or her mother and her to go to the library and have stories read. And so that's the setting for this first story. Uh, the librarian was reading an alphabet story to the children. And the librarian opened the book up and began the story. A is for... And my granddaughter apparently, and this story is told through the eyes of her father, um, was sitting there and said very carefully, Ah... Or raw. The librarian looked down at the little girl in front of her and said, yes, A is for apple. To which my granddaughter rep replied, A por raw. The librarian once 
again looked down at my granddaughter and said, A is for apple. To which my granddaughter replied, A for raw. At that stage, my son said he intervened and said something like, one of these days, my daughter is going to be bilingual, but only if people like you and I ensure that she has the opportunities to be bilingual. I guess I tell that story because sometimes children, learners, are seen to come to school with some sort of deficit that there is a problem that resides with children or their families and that schools, just like the librarian, see this as an opportunity to fix them up. The second story I want to talk about is the importance of the relationships and interactions between students and teachers. And this story is about my older granddaughter and it is a story that um, came out when she was about three months into school. They were doing a unit on me and my family, and she'd been asked to draw a picture about her family. Akaramiya drew the picture of her family. In it were her father, her mother, uh, who was pregnant with her, her new sister, and herself. Um, I looked at the picture and thought, yeah, well, that's great, but where am I? And where's a grandfather? Because Karamea had grown up in a situation where every weekend she lived in our home, and then during the week she went back with her mum and dad. I I'm afraid I did ask the question, and her response was, family is what lives in your house. So... I guess the question that I ask is, when do we start changing children's experiences, children's prior knowledge and background experience? When do we start challenging those and changing those so that they become something other than what they are perhaps coming to school with? And what are the implications for literacy learning when we do that? Because this notion of cultural toolkit that's been provided for us by Jerome Brunner would have us really think about how do whānau type relationships influence learning in the school and what do we understand by culture and knowledge and actually how do we understand pedagogy. This further makes me think about is literacy learning top down or is it bottom-up? Or is it an and-and? I think all of those have implications for literacy learning as we go forward. I know Bell Hooks talked about power, and in her, um, in her publication, she talks about how power must be collectively directed in different ways in order to expand the possibilities of how students and teachers come to know and work in their worlds. She suggests that when teachers invite, when they listen, when they learn from their students, and students take responsibilities to be equally committed to creating a learning context, we have what Māori use the term ako. We have the ability to create relational and responsive dialogical teaching and learning spaces. And when I think about children whose culture differs from the culture of the school, I think we need to really be able to interrogate that process and think about what that looks like and what that means for us as educators. I wonder when this pulling, pulling away or joining up of the context of what's in children's cultural toolkit and what is it that the schools see as knowledge, as learning. I wonder when that begins to either converge or create some dissonance. I know my youngest granddaughter, who's just learning to talk, has got this word, well actually it's a phrase, and it sort of sounds like this, ASAP. 
I was listening to her saying this to her older cousin, and I watched them as they were, were um, in, engaging with each other. And my older granddaughter, in response to ASAP, said, listen, Nanny, she, has, she hasn't got all the words yet, but she's got the tune. And so I think it begins to happen. This, this, what children come to school with, what's in their cultural toolkit, begins to happen from the day they're born. And how do we as educators capitalise on that? Because I think that's one of the really important um, concepts of creating relational responsive dialogic teaching and learning spaces. If we don't start young, through talking, through enjoying the magic of words in many forms and many languages, what are the implications of that? Because I think that when we do do that, then we almost have this seamless interaction for many, for many students of building from talk into reading. I know what's important or what I've seen as being important is that there is a need to model what we want as adults. We need to make reading, we need to make books, we need to make literacy, we need to make oracy accessible to our children. And when we make it an everyday event, a little bit often, soon the meaningful connections between what we're talking about and what we're saying begin to emerge. Those marks on the page will be understood as stories to be told. However, when we think about that notion at home of relationships being central to the learning, we know that learning doesn't happen in a vacuum. And the idea is then about how do we transfer that into the school setting. One of the things that I've learned from Te Kotahitanga in the 14 years of research that we've been engagement, engaged with is that culturally and relationally responsive pedagogy is accomplished when people are connected at a relational level. That also involves a common vision of what constitutes educational excellence where learners can be more self-determining in their learning and when pedagogy is interactive and dialogic. When we have contexts such as this, knowledge can be actively co-constructed and the cultural experiences of all participants have validity. However, sometimes the magic doesn't happen. So what then? And I guess this is happening for many Māori students if you look at the evidence of educational outcomes for this particular group of students. We haven't managed to close the gaps with them. One of the most successful programs that I've seen used to help support both Māori and non-Māori students is Pause Prompt Praise, which grew out of the work that Stuart McNaughton, Ted Glynn, Vivian Robinson and Rosemary Quinn did in the 70s. And again, if we think about this in terms of the notion of culturally responsive and relational pedagogy, the focus is on how do we actually create a context for learning where the students themselves can be directing the learning. And we as adults, we as the teacher, can give responsive feedback based on what the child does. In pause prompt praise, for example, for correct reading or for self-correction with help from the tutor, we're asked to give specific praise. And often one of the things that we do is comment when the child makes an error and we don't actually do anything for the correct reading. So that's one of the important first steps in pause prompt praise, acknowledging when the child does something right. For incorrect reading, the first thing that we need to be thinking about is what is the child doing with their reading? And rather than jumping in when they make an error, 
pause to see whether the child can actually do anything on, the, on their own. According to the research, and I've never been able to find any different reading in English anyway, there are three different errors that children make in their reading. The first one is that sometimes they don't attempt the word. The second, sometimes the word doesn't make sense within the context of the sentence. And the third error is if the word makes sense but, is, but it is incorrect. Pause prompt praise suggests that when we pause and think about what sort of error the child is making, we also create thinking space for both the learner and the tutor. And the best prompts are the sort of prompt that will take the reader through that space of not knowing into a space of learning. Pause prompt praise suggests that if the word is not attempted after the pause, the prompt is merely to read on or read again. And then if the child comes to the word on their own, then the specific praise follows. If the word makes, does not make sense, the pause to create the thinking space is followed with a prompt about what the word means. And again, if the word is uh, arrived at by the reader, then specific praise. If the word makes sense but is, not, but is incorrect, again, the pause, the thinking time, followed by a prompt about how the word looks or sounds. Often parents are supported or rather not supported, to listen to their children read, and so they replicate what they experienced as readers themselves, and that is that they often go straight to the sounding out, which is not very successful. Pause prompt praise has been um, used successfully in English, and it's been used successfully in Māori as tatari tautoko tauwhi. Tatari Tautoko Tauafi was developed or reconstructed with Ted Glynn um, by a research whānau of interest. And one of the things that we found as part of that development was how do you actually engage with families, how do you engage with schools in a way that will perpetuate the shared learning or the goal of working together. As a research whānau, learning within and from cultural contexts, whānau-like relationships, or whanaungatanga, were the way to develop relationships of trust and respect, both with the school staff, but also with the families with whom we were seeking to engage. Whanaungatanga is often seen as something that happens and the sooner you get it over and done with, the better. However, I know why Harawera who talked about whanaungatanga as being the intervention. And once you go through those familial-like, those whanau-like counters, encounters, um, then the relationship to actually do the work to actually have the joint goal is your better place to be able to do that. So in terms of beginning that type of relationship, one of the things that I found is that the first thing that Māori communities want to know is who you are, not what you are. You might be a teacher or you might be a doctor or you might be a professor but actually, Māori communities want to know who you are before they know what you are. In terms of interactions that make a difference, in terms of culturally responsive relationships, that requires us to listen to communities. And I think we do have to really be asking ourselves to what extent is listening currently a feature of our relationships with Māori communities. And if we're doing more talking than we're doing listening, what are the implications 
for those communities. If we return to culturally responsive pedagogy of relations for some critical cons considerations, the first point that I would make is that when people are connected through whānau-like, through family-like family relationships of respect and trust, it's more likely that a common vision of what excellence is and how each group will contribute can become clear. In contexts such as these, power needs to be shared so that learners feel able to be what they, who they are and, they, and that requires them to be able to be self-determining. Pedagogy is often dialogic, it's interactive, it spirals backwards and forwards, and in contexts such as these, knowledge is able to be actively co-constructed. It doesn't sit with an expert to tell the other what to do. The other thing that I think is important in contexts such as these is the cultural experiences of all, or the cultural toolkit of all, have validity and can contribute to the conversation that is learning. One of the things that I would suggest we need to do is consider how these principles play out in the current relationships and interactions you have when engaging with Māori. So some critical questions, and when I use the term critical, I'm thinking about how power plays out in terms of critical theory in terms of critical pedagogy. One of the questions might be, how is power shared between self-determining individuals within non-dominating relationships, relations of interdependence? Which is a bit of a mouthful, but actually it says it all, because if you are sharing power, then the relationships should be interdependent and one group shouldn't be dominating over the other. In your work, whatever it is, around literacy or around other areas of learning, how do you demonstrate to Māori whose cultural toolkit counts? How does that play out and what does that sound like and look like? In what ways is learning, learning between yourself and Māori whānau and communities, in what ways is learning interactive, dialogic and spiralling? How do people feel connected to one another? How do schools and Māori whānau and community feel connected to each other? How do they feel connected to you? And what is the common vision for what constitutes educational excellence? We have a very good guide for that in Kahikitea which actually gives us the mandate to be acting accordingly. I believe that working together can make a significant difference. Working together can occur when schools support parents to support their child's learning through programs that are designed to develop specific skills. For example, the skills that will promote reading, writing, language development, all forms of literacy. It can also occur when professionals, family, whānau and community members are taught to use smart schools where they're monitored and given feedback on their use of those tools. Evaluations like these help the researchers refine the tools and ensure that the accompanying process support effective, independent use of the tools at home and in school so that those processes, that expertise, resides within those home communities to use with all of their children or whenever they need to use them. In terms of research, what I've learned from research with schools, I've learned that Māori parents engage in school settings where their children are provided with contexts where they have mana, where their children are successful. I've seen that this often resides around kapahaka and sport. Without having a direct invitation to Māori parents 
Māori parents turn up. They're there at kapahaka events, they're there on the sporting sideline. Therefore, what I would suggest is that schools need to ensure classrooms reflect successful context for Māori children because I believe that this is encouraging parental engagement. Where their children have mana, where they are successful, I believe Māori parents will turn up on their own accord. To maximise the relationship between schools and Māori families, Māori families need to be part of determining the relationship, which means that they need to be part of the power base. And actually what I've learned is that changing the status quo or changing the fabric of New Zealand society is very challenging. Historically, I know that mainstream schools have defined how Māori parents and their whānau will participate. What I'm suggesting is that whānau themselves have never been allowed to determine on their own terms how they can and how they will to, uh, contribute to the schools. And I would suggest that this might be where we need to be heading, creating context where Farno say, I want to be able to work with this or I want to be able to work with that. What I've seen is that when schools provide spaces, both metaphoric spaces and physical spaces, that allow Farno and the school to talk together to work together for the benefit of Māori students, then Māori whānau will participate. I believe that the creation of such spaces can be mutually beneficial. School leaders and teachers can be informed upon about the community in which they serve, and they can also have access to a body of knowledge, or as Louis Mole calls it, the funds of knowledge within the Māori community, that has traditionally been untapped by schools. The spaces also present an opportunity for the school to build the capacity of the Māori community to contribute to the learning and the capacity of schools to learn from the Māori community. Spaces such as these need to reflect a context that say to whānau, you belong here, we want you here, we have some knowledge, and we recognise that you have knowledge, and by working together, we can all be more powerful. In conclusion, I would suggest that it's important to understand and respect the practices, the images and metaphors of our learners, because it is from this position that relationships and outcomes can be more holistic and focused on power sharing, individual agency, collaboration and well-being. By seeking to participate within the cultural experiences and sense-making of our learners, we can all have more meaningful experiences, valid questions, and more legitimate concerns. In contexts such as these, we all have a part to play, and it is only together that we can really make it happen for families that have often been marginalised and rendered invisible. Kia ora koutou.